Occasional okay, dear devotees, please accept my humble obeisances. All rest to Srila Prabhupada and Guru Maharaj. And today's class will be by His Grace uh, Bhuta Bhavana Prabhuji. Um, Prabhuji is going to enlighten us on the topic of Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, second chapter, and 23rd verse. Um, Prabhuji, I'll just uh, share the screen and you can take over. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, so I hope everyone's well. Um, so we're going to read from Third Canto, chapter 2, text number 23. Very interesting verse. Um, and we're going to then also discuss something about the pastime and the, um, the teachings of Srila Prabhupada's commentary on this particular verse. Before we begin, we'll just say, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So... I'll just read the Sanskrit, then the transliteration, translation will go from there. Aho bakiyam stana kalakutam jikham sayapayayad apyasitvi am apyasadvi lebhegatim di lebhegatim da triuchitam tatonyam Kamdva dayalam sharanam vrajema. Aho, alas, Baki, the she demon Putana, Yam, whom stana of her breast, Kala, deadly, Kutam, poison, Jigham shaya, out of envy, Apayayat, nourished, Api, although, Asadvi, unfaithful, Lebhe, achieved, Gatim, Destination, datri uchitam, just suitable for the nurse, tataha, beyond whom, anyam, other, come, who else, va, certainly, dayalum, merciful, sharanam, shelter, vrajema, shall I take. Translation and purple by His Divine Grace, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Swami Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Alas, how shall I take shelter of one more merciful than he who granted the position of mother to a sheep demon, Putana, although she was unfaithful and she prepared deadly poison to be sucked from her breast? Purple. Here is an example of the extreme mercy of the Lord, even to his enemy. It is said that a noble man accepts the good qualities of a person of doubtful character. This is one accepts nectar from a stock of poison. In his babyhood, he was administered deadly poison by Putana, a she demon who tried to kill the wonderful baby. And because she was a demon, it was impossible for her to know that the Supreme Lord, even though playing the part of a baby, was no one less than the same Supreme Personality of Godhead. His value as the Supreme Lord did not diminish upon his becoming a baby to please his devotee Yashoda. The Lord may assume the form of a baby or a shape other than that of a human being, but it doesn't make the slightest difference. He is always the same supreme. A living creature, however powerful he may, be, he may become, by dint of severe penance, can never become equal to the supreme Lord. Lord Krishna accepted the motherhood of Putana because she pretended to be an affectionate mother, allowing Krishna to suck her breast. The Lord accepts the least qualification of the living entity and awards him the highest reward. That is the standard of his character. Therefore, who but the Lord can be the ultimate shelter? Okay, it's a very, very wonderful verse. Very wonderful purple, and this has a lot of meaning. So we'll say uh, Mangalacharyan, and then we'll have some discussion, then we'll open up for questions as well. Omegyana Timuranda Siya Gyananjana Shilakaya, Chekshu Militam Yenatas May Shri Gurave Namaha, Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapitam Ye Nabutale, Swayam Rupakada Mayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam, Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Patikamalam Shri Guru and Vaishnavamscha. Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Tuam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Virjana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita 
Shri Vishakam Vitam Sacha. Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Chagat Pate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindav Nishvari Rishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchika Patrubhyas Cha Kripa Sindhu Vyevacha Patita Nambhava Nebhyo Vaishna Vebhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasudhi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So, this is a wonderful pastime, actually. The pastime of Krishna killing Putana. So Putana came, and she came as a mother, actually. So she was um, working under the direction of Kamsa. She came as a mother, or in that mood, and she, wanted to, she had poison on her breasts, and Krishna, <laughs> he sucked her breast, but he actually killed her in the process. It is, it is explained by the Acharyas. And you know, we hear often that she, Krishna is so kind, she was delivered. So she, she was able to return to the spiritual world. And that's true. And she's there in the parental mood. That is also true. There's a, there are many subtleties to this pastime. One of them is that even though she's in the spiritual world, and even though she's there in the parental rasa, but Salyuras, but she never gets the opportunity to be directly, um, to serve Krishna directly. So she was delivered, but there's also so many nuances to this. So this verse is very interesting as well. This is third canto chapter two, text number 23. So we hear in the Bhagavatam, in the earlier part of the Bhagavatam, especially the first canto, that Shukadevka Swami, he was in, within the womb of his mother, and while he was in the womb of his mother, he heard the Srimad Bhagavatam from his father, Vyasadeva. Okay, so Vyasadeva, um, he gave a synopsis, like a summary of the Bhagavatam, because he knew that when his son comes out of the womb, his son will not stay at home. So when Shukadev Goswami came out of the womb, he immediately left home. And his father wanted him to come back. His father, you know, missed him. He wanted to um, had that association. At one point, Vyasadeva sent two disciples. The Sukadev Goswami was living in the forest. Vyasadeva sent two disciples to try to encourage him to come back. And each disciple shared a particular verse of the Bhagavatam. One disciple shared a verse from the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 21, text number 5. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to read that to you, and you may want to put it on the screen. But I'll read this to you. And the reason why this is important is because this verse, which was shared by one of the disciples of Shukadev Goswami, this verse was very much appreciated by Shukadev Goswami. And this verse had a special meaning to it, actually. So I'll just um, read the verse and then go from there. Uh, Prabhuji, can you just tell me the verse once again? Yes, 10.21.5. Okay. Okay. So, we'll just wait till this comes on the screen. 10.21.5. And then I'll just, um, I'll just read the, the English, actually. I'll just read the translation. Okay. Wearing a peacock feather ornament upon his head, blue karnikara, yeah. karnikara flowers, on his ears, a yellow garment as brilliant as gold and a Vajayanti garland. Lord Krishna exhibited his transcendental form as the greatest of dancers as he entered the forest of Vrindavan, beautifying it with the marks of his footprints. He filled the holes of his flute with the nectar of his lips and the cowherd boys sang his glory. So Shukadev Goswami, he heard this verse from one of the disciples of Vyasadeva. And he was, he was very attracted, you know, you know, so he, he felt this is amazing, so, many, so much attraction. 
But what was interesting is when he, when he heard this, he thought, so many are beautiful, but inside they're not attractive. I want to see how the heart is. So the second verse we heard is a verse that we're reading now. So if you could go back to that previous verse, please. 3, 2, 23. So Shukadev Goswami also heard this verse from one of the disciples of Vyasadev, okay? And this verse was indicating the beauty of the Lord's character. So the first verse that we just shared, that was also giving an indication of the Lord's beautiful form. But this verse relates to the beauty of Krishna's character. This verse was originally spoken by Uddhava. And this verse is how Krishna delivered Putana, who came to murder him. Right? So Prabhupada also in this purple expands upon this because of Krishna's great quality and kindness. Yeah? That is the standard of his character, Prabhupada says towards the end of this particular purple. So this is very, very significant. But when Shukadev Goswami heard this verse, that was enough to actually um, convince him to return home. He returned home. And Vyasadeva, when he returned home, he, he further explore, um, explained the Srimad Bhagavatam to Shukadev Goswami. Right? So this is a very, very powerful point. Krishna is beautiful inside, unlimitedly beautiful inside, and unlimitedly beautiful outside. That's what it means to be all attractive. All attractive means all attractive in every single respect, by every single dimension, by every single criteria. He's beautiful. Uh, so it's very, very powerful that this beauty of the Lord is being indicated here. Okay. And what is that beautiful beauty of the Lord? Is that he is ready to deliver anyone and everyone. Okay. We want to give you a bit of an understanding about this pastime also that this verse relates to. So Putana is a sister of Agasura and Bakasura. Therefore, another name for, Suta, uh, for Putana is Baki, right? Because she's a sister of Bakasura. And Putana, Bhakti Thakur explains that the demons in Krishna's pastimes, they relate to different anatas. So, Pust so Putana attempts to kill the, the beginnings of the spiritual tendency, okay? So... Putin is very, very interesting. She works for Kampa, Kamsa, sorry. Kamsa, he represents empiricists, those who see the world as being the all in all, okay? So it's very interesting that people who've got that mentality, they also tend to give a dictionary definition to the scriptures. So they distort the real meaning of the scriptures. And they don't understand that the scriptures will only be revealed to one who has surrendered to a bona fide spiritual master in the disciplic succession, okay? And that's also something that's brought up in the summary um, in an art, harmonist article on Putana, which was given by Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, okay? So in that, in that harmonist article, you can see that the, uh, the summary that's given by Bhakti, no, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, and he men mentions that. So, so Putana represents the false guru, right? Putana, the witch, who tried to kill Krishna, she represents the false guru, okay? So, a deceitful guru, what does that mean? There's two types of deceitful guru. One is the guru who preaches sense gratification or liberation or both, rather than one who, who preaches service to Krishna, okay? That's the first type of guru. The second guru that Putana represents is the material mind. Okay, which is the tendency for mundane reasoning and trying to bring that um, to the scripture rather than accepting the scripture as it's given according to Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. Okay, now how she was killed. Okay, so Krishna sucked the life out of her breasts. In this way, he protects the innocent ecstasy, which is originally in the hearts of the young devotees. So when someone comes to Krishna consciousness, they have to guard against two types of gurus. The false guru who teaches something other than Krishna consciousness and the material mind. Okay. So Putana, 
In her previous life, she was a personality named Ratnamala, who was a younger sister, uh, who was actually um, related to Bali Maharaj. Okay, but we'll get it. We'll get into that maybe another time. So, Puta means purity. Na means not. Putana, she who is not pure. <laughs> That's actually the meaning of her name. Okay, and the other name and the other meaning, Putan means she who takes away or carries even innocent babies because she was attempting to kill the, the children, the babies in Vrindavan. Okay, so um, a few things to bring out here on this particular point. Um, let's see. So in this purple, or let's say even in this verse, Alas, how shall I take shelter of one more merciful than he who granted the position of mother to a she-demon, Putana, although she was unfaithful and she prepared deadly poison to be sucked from her breast? First of all, the, the, and this is really key, and this is something I'm also meditating on again and again to try and develop properly the same quality. In Krishna consciousness, we can only make it all the way if we develop mercy. We need to receive mercy. We need to um, imbibe mercy. So it can be offered to us, the receiving. We need to make it part of ourselves. So we need to imbibe mercy and we need to give that mercy to other people. In other words, for anyone to exist in this world and to make progress in Krishna consciousness properly, we must become an instrument of mercy and compassion. You'll see if you look very closely in the material world, there are, there are many people who are bitter, frustrated, angry, and resentful. Many people. And that is the inevitable result of failing to develop mercy. Mercy and compassion. In, in the material world, uh, Jivo Jivasya Sajivanam. In this material world, one living entity is food for another living entity. When I was young, I was very, very naive or innocent. Because my parents were very straightforward, I assumed that everyone is straightforward. And I'll be honest, I was so shocked. As I grew, I was so shocked to realize people can lie openly, they can play politics. They can undermine people behind their back. They can, they can, you know, they can literally um, deliberately manipulate and exploit people. So I was like, wow, this is, wow, couldn't believe it. But this is the nature of the material world. Unfortunately, this is the nature of the material world. Um, there's one place where Prabhupada writes, the material world is full of um, in so many embarrassing and irritating situations. Unless one is inclined to be very forgiving, one's consciousness will be soiled with a vindictive mentality that ruins one's spiritual consciousness. So this quality of compassion, mercy, forgiveness, it is so, it is so essential to a practicing devotee that without it, you can almost predict that this is a person who's not going to make it um, to the highest states of Krishna consciousness without that quality. Mm. Humility must be there, compassion must be there, mercy must be there, and for many good reasons. Many of us have issues and illnesses which relate to a lack of compassion, a lack of humility, a lack of mercy actually. Because if I'm not compassionate, if I'm not merciful, I can't be forgiving. If I'm not able to forgive, what will happen? In a world such as ours, I will inevitably go through challenging experiences. And because I've not developed the, the quality of forgiveness, those challenging experiences will cause me to become bitter and resentful. Now, what happens when an individual is bitter and resentful is that they age. 
because holding on to negative emotions causes stress and starts to damage and wear down even the physical body, but it does that through the medium of damaging and wearing down the mind. So the mind is the seat of the emotions. So people who hold on to negative emotions are literally poisoning and polluting their own body, mind, and intelligence. I repeat, if we hold on to negative emotions, we literally poison our own mind, intelligence, and body. Now, it goes further, because when we know, when we know this, what's the natural conclusion? If my mind, intelligence, and body is polluted, that means that my entire existence is polluted. So we have to learn the art of compassion and mercy. Krishna is the most merciful. His devotees associating with him eternally are the most merciful. So it is to be understood that for anyone who sincerely associates with Krishna and his pure devotees, they will also develop those same qualities of mercy. So the first and most important factor for anyone who wants to be a devotee and who wants to be merciful is to do a careful and scrutinizing study of our association. If I associate with, with those who have poison in their hearts, I will develop poison in my heart. If I, do, if I associate with those who have mercy, compassion, and devotion in their hearts, and if I serve those people, what they have in their hearts will also enter into my own heart. It is all a question of association. Right? Here in the purple, look at this sentence. Here is an example of the extreme mercy of the Lord, even to his enemy. I shared a post on Instagram. So on Instagram, I share these different quotes or just you know, posts that I've come across, ideas and so on. So this point, even to his enemy. So I shared a post recently saying that we have no, ultimately we have no enemies, only teachers. We, we need to develop a mentality whereby we are able to learn and grow from every type of association. Okay. And at the same time, in order to have mercy and compassion for others, and this is very, very important, so please listen carefully to this, in order to have mercy and compassion to others, we must make sure that we are, we are being sufficiently merciful and compassionate to who? To who? Ourselves. Ourselves. Absolutely. The number of times that I've seen in this movement, people who come to Krishna consciousness and do not have a certain balance of character. They then read the books and what they do, again, the Putin principle, what they do, what we do, is we project our own mentality onto the scriptures, you see? And that distorts the true meaning of the scriptures. It also distorts the true application of the scriptures. And so I've understood it wrong, because I'm projecting my own idea. I've applied it wrong because I didn't understand it properly. And then what does that lead to? If I understand wrong, that's my sambandha's wrong. If my sambandha is wrong, my sambandha gyan is wrong, then my abhideya, which is my application will be wrong. And if my abhideya or application is wrong, my prayojana, the goal that I achieve will be the wrong goal. 
Krishna consciousness has never, will never make an individual bitter and resentful. It is just a question of the proper application. Really important. This first sentence is so powerful. Here is an example of the extreme, not just mercy, the extreme mercy of the Lord, even to his enemy. So if we are in association with Krishna, we have to be so, or we need to develop to the point that we can even do good for our enemy. Hmm? And who are our enemies? In a sense, we have no external enemies. But in another sense, we do have a very close enemy, which the Bhagavad Gita talks about. He says, the, what can be the best friend or the worst enemy? What does Bhagavad Gita alert us to? Mind. Absolutely, Shilpa. Thank you. Our minds, our material mind, not talking about the spiritualized mind or the spiritualized intelligence, but as long as the mind is material, the mind will act as an enemy. Okay. This is really, really important to understand. So our process is to purify Chaito Dapana Marjanam. And how do I know that I'm becoming purified? I know, and this is this is the second sentence that Prabhupada gives. It is said that a noble man accepts the good qualities of a person of doubtful character, just as one accepts nectar from a stock of poison. Prabhupada will sometimes quote Chanakya. One can accept gold from a dirty place. Very, very important teaching. Because what does it mean? As we go out into the world, we can see people, and sometimes we come across people who have bad qualities. At that point, what are we meant to do? At that point, what we're meant to do is try to see what is good within the bad. What can I learn from this particular experience? Why is Krishna allowing me to experience this? And what is the lesson that I can integrate from this experience? When life is incredibly exciting when you know that Krishna is everywhere. Life is incredibly exciting when you know that there are no accidents. Why? Because when we know that there are no accidents and when we know that Krishna is always there and when we want to hear and understand what he wants, then every single moment of every single day, there'll be learning. And where there's learning, there's transformation. And when there's transformation, then we are growing. Very, very, very powerful. So this point about learning from everyone, it can only happen when we have mercy because mercy allows me not to become immediately triggered by a negative behavior of another person. Mercy, mercy is like a bulletproof vest. If you have a bulletproof vest on, people may shoot at you, but actually, that bulletproof vest completely absorbs the impact and it completely protects you. Right? So, mercy and compassion are like a bulletproof vest. What we, what we fail to do as devotees so often is we fail to learn the lesson before the test. You see? Intelligence means the ability to learn a lesson before the examination. That's the sign of intelligence. Anyone who learns the lesson before the test is, a, is an intelligent man or woman. And there's a very few of those people in the world right now. This, this lesson that we need to learn, if, we are, if we're to move through life in a positive way, is to learn to develop compassion and mercy now. Because later on in life, at various points in life, our mercy and our compassion will be tested by the challenging behavior of others. Right? 
It's very, very interesting. This pastime, Krishna is approached by Putana. She's a she-demon. She tries to kill him. Okay. But it doesn't actually make any difference at all. Krishna is so kind that he, he took it in the positive light. If we do not develop spiritual strength, which is also shown by this humility, compassion, tolerance, etc., in, in a spiritually weak state where we are susceptible to the poison of the envy of the material world. The material world is characterized by envy. It's characterized by a mentality of bitterness and resentfulness. And what happens when someone is bitter and resentful? The poison in the cup spilleth over. A bitter and resentful person will try to act negatively towards others due to their own bitterness and resentment. Mm -hmm. They try to spread the poison. Just as Putin tried to poison Krishna, a bitter and resentful person tries to spread the poison of their own existence onto other people. And the only antidote for that bitterness and that poison is compassion and mercy. You cannot fight fire with fire. When you try to fight fire with fire, you get two people who are burned. You remove one negative quality in the world by, by connecting it with its opposing element. So the bitterness and the resentment of the material world, the envy of the material world is healed with the ointment of compassion. It's interesting. When Shukadev Goswami heard this verse, he came back home from the forest. In the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam, when, when Shukadev Goswami talks about this pastime of Putana being killed by Krishna, he devotes 44 verses to this pastime. More verses to this pastime of, of Krishna killing Putana than any other pastime of Krishna with the demons. And the Acharyas explain that the reason why he does this is out of gratitude to Putana. Because when he heard this verse about this particular pastime, then that became so, he became so attracted that he, can, that he, he came embraced back to hear more about the Bhagavatam. So it's a very, very powerful and very significant pastime with extraordinarily significant teachings so the question now becomes how do we develop this compassion and mercy we touch upon the first point we have to be compassionate and merciful to ourselves so that we have capacity to do that for others so when we look after ourselves physically mentally emotionally scripturally we are building our capacity Right. Bhaktivinoda no Thakur says, unless one is a Paramahamsa, one has to have good care for the body, good stimulation for the mind, right? So good care for the body, so that's physically looking after ourselves. Good stimulation for the mind, that's mentally looking after ourselves. That's also to do, um, to do with engaging our nature where possible. Good, uh, let's see, good for, care for the body, good stimulation for the mind, good social situation, right? What does that mean? It means that we look after ourselves emotionally by having good association with those who are swajati. Swajati means like-minded, right? There can be many people who are devotees, but close friendship happens with devotees who are like-minded. Prabhupada talks about this in the, Bhagavat um, in the Bhagavatam. Third Canto, Chapter 29, Text Number 17 in the Purple, Swajati, like-minded. He says, those who are of mutual interest and understanding, he says, friendship should be made amongst those who are of mutual interest and understanding. So, care for the body, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, stimulation for the mind, 
good social situation. And then he says also good study of the scripture. That is looking after ourselves, looking after our spiritual intelligence, engaging and purifying our spiritual intelligence. He says, study scripture in order to see how to bring all of these elements together. When we do this, when we do this in a quality way, when we do this in a consistent way, we're actually building out, we're building up and building out our capacity for compassion. Excuse me. This is how we build our capacity for compassion because you can only give what you have. So, so often you can literally predict that a particular devotee is going to have an issue because they're neglecting themselves in some key area of life. Some devotees, they neglect themselves physically and therefore they have some issue on the health level. There are some devotees, they neglect themselves mentally so they can have some issue on the level of the mind. There are some devotees who neglect themselves socially. So they run into social challenges. And there are some devotees who neglect themselves intellectually. So then later on, that becomes a problem for that particular devotee. Now, what is also understood is that as long as we are in the conditioned state, that's what Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, unless one is a Paramahamsa, it is understood that one area affects the other. If we're really ill, the physical issue can affect the mind, the intelligence, and the, the emotions. Right? If one is emotionally too disturbed, it can affect the physical, the mind, etc. So each area interacts with another area. So a devotee who is intelligent, I repeat, a devotee who is intelligent will ensure that they are looking after their spiritual life in all of these different dimensions. Now, that doesn't mean we have to overdo it. We look at the example of Srila Prabhupada. I'm going to ask you, what was one thing Prabhupada did for his physical health? What did Prabhupada do for his physical health? One thing, Morning one walk. idea. Sorry? Morning walk. Absolutely, Sri Devi. Thank you. So he was still chanting, but he could chant on a, on a walk, right? So he used that as an opportunity. He would associate with the devotees. He would chant. He would preach. But he was also automatically looking after himself. What was something else that Prabhupada did for his physical health? Massage. Absolutely. What massage does, massage can actually keep the body much more um, healthy for a longer time. It's not, just a, it's not just a question of rubbing the body. Massage helps to ground the body. It helps to calm the nervous system. It, has, it does so many different things. But Prabhupada, he just made it part of his program to take care of his body, but not in such a way that it took away from his Krishna consciousness. Right? It didn't become an over-obsession. He just did what he needed to do so the body would not be an unnecessary obstacle for his, uh, for his preaching and his service to his spiritual master and to the entire world. I, I want you to really take this seriously. I want you to think about this in your own spiritual life. And, and, it's, and it's different for different people. Some people, sometimes in their life, they may need to do a little bit more for the body, and sometimes a little bit less. And sometimes a bit more for the intelligence, sometimes a little bit less, etc. But wherever you are neglectful, that's the point. Where you are neglectful, that is where Maya can come in. So, Putana represents the false guru. Okay. It, meaning the guru who preaches liberation or sense gratification but she also represents the false guru of the material mind, the materialistic mind. Every day Krishna is communicating with all of us, directly and indirectly, through various circumstances and situations, but we have to be ready to listen to 
and accept Krishna's guidance. And we do this through sincerely following the teachings of Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra, and continually, continually, as we said before, learning before the test. Intelligence means to learn the lesson before the test is given. And if we do this, learn the lessons, if we develop the compassion, develop the mercy, then when the test comes, when we are faced with people who are envious, um, who are resentful, who are bitter, and who are trying to spread that poison, we will be able to navigate the situation and not be brought down because we have already accepted the lessons of compassion, mercy, humility, and forgiveness. And we've built that, those lessons into our very being, into our very consciousness before the tests have come. Okay, so let me stop here and let's open up for questions and comments. Do you have any questions, any comments from anyone? Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. Uh, very nice class. Um, very wonderful points. Uh, I have a question, uh, Prabhu. So you were talking um, all the time about mercy and compassion. compassion. Uh, so that starts from ourselves. But what actually is mercy? Like, uh, usually I heard that mercy is coming from outside, like uh, from Guru and Krishna. Uh, and from other devotees uh, who are very merciful to bring us into Krishna consciousness. Yes. So how can we merciful for, for ourselves and also how can we give mercy to others? Because I am think, I don't think that I'm very much qualified to give mercy to others. Yes. So. So Prabhupada, when, when devotees ask Prabhupada, how can we repay you? He says, well, I've given, well, I've done for you, you do for others. So you, as, you, as you said, Srimati, um, the point is we received mercy from our gurus, okay? But Lord Chaitanya, he is also emphasized that everyone is to become a guru. And what does that mean? It means that everyone is also meant to pass on the mercy that they've been given. Because actually, by passing on the mercy that you've been given, that is your, that is your way of, of also um, receiving more mercy. Yep. When we give what we've been given, we receive even more. That's the point. This is very, very important. Okay. So okay. by giving that mercy that we've received, so someone told us about Krishna. And because they told us about Krishna, we were able to change our entire life and, and to grow and, and to engage in this, wonderful, um, in this wonderful lifestyle, mission, service, sadhana, everything. They gave us that mercy. So now we are to give that to other people. There is one other point I want to make before I take any other questions. And that is, in giving mercy, we have to give mercy mercifully. Mm. Right? The biggest mistake that we make, or one of the biggest mistakes we make as neophyte devotees, is we don't know how to give mercy properly. So therefore, we allow ourselves to, let's say, sometimes um, deal with others in a way that causes them to mistreat us or allows them to mistreat us or allows us to become unnecessarily frustrated. So in the nature of instruction, Prabhupada explains how the, the Madhyam Adhikari, they discriminate. Mm. They give mercy to the innocent. They avoid the envious. They're always engaged in serving the pure devotees, right? They make friendships with equals, etc. All of these different qualities are all qualities of discrimination. So they give mercy mercifully. Why is that important? Because when you give mercy mercifully, you're able to give it to the extent that people can accept. You're able to give it in the way that people can accept. You're able to give it to the people who can accept. And you do it, therefore, in a way that causes them to make minimum offenses to devotees and to the process if i allow myself to be mistreated 
I'm actually committing violence on the person who's mistreating me. Very, very deep. It's a very deep understanding of mercy. If I allow myself to be unnecessarily mistreated by anyone, I'm committing violence on the person who is mistreating me. So sometimes compassion means to say something. Sometimes compassion means to address an issue. Sometimes compassion means to, to love from a distance. So these are all ways of, be, of giving mercy in a merciful way. Does that make sense? So to put it another, another way, when we engage in devotional service, when we engage in these loving exchanges, we're meant to engage in these loving dealings with devotees, but that loving dealing has to always be based upon the truth. What is the truth of the situation? Okay, this devotee who I'm interacting with, if I just stop for a moment and say, what is the truth about this person? Okay, they're not necessarily completely pure. They have some conditioned nature. Okay, that's true, but so do I, right? There's no problem with that, right? I'm dealing with this person. Okay, I've noticed that they tend to gossip about everyone. Okay, so I can still share something about myself as long as I know that while I'm sharing, I don't mind that they're going to share it with other people because I know that they have a tendency to gossip. I can't think that they're gossiping about everyone to me, but, I sh I, but they're going to be completely confidential. No. What they are is shown by what they do. And therefore, I need to then take that into account when I decide how I act. You see, again, what people are is shown by what they do. And I have to then decide how I deal with them by the way that I act. In other words, as devotees, the real art of, of Sadhu Sangha is to love and serve wisely. We can all see in our lives and in the lives of others that when people do not love and serve wisely, you get some bad experience, isn't it? You may get hurt, you may get frustrated, you may become disappointed. It's not because of, it's not, and then people think it's because I loved and served the devotees. No, it's because I loved and served unwisely. But what Krishna consciousness is the full story. It is to love and to serve wisely. Right? Does that answer your question, Shumati? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, Prabhupada. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is a new I, thing for me. I just, uh, I never heard this topic. Uh, so this is very new. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I have posted a question by Devananda yes. Pandit Prabhupada, please. Um, okay. So Devananda Pandit writes, I heard from senior devotee that creep and mercy is an outward expression of rasa. All, ex all exalted devotees in their prayers to Krishna described in Srimad Bhagavatam appeal precisely to his mercy. It is strange for me that there are people who do not believe in the power of prayer and therefore in the mercy and compassion of, of, of Krishna. Yeah. Can such person be called atheist? Definitely. Yes. Thanks. Um, yeah, absolutely. If people do not have faith, that is, that is atheism ultimately. Right? A lack of faith in Krishna. Therefore, we talk about atheism as if it's a category, but technically speaking, atheism is a spectrum. Right? I repeat, we talk about atheists as being a category. Oh, he's an atheist or she's an atheist, and then that person is not an atheist. But atheism is actually a spectrum. There are degrees of atheism. Right? And the only person who has no atheism at all is the pure devotee because they have full faith, which means full surrender. To the extent that we lack faith in Krishna, to that extent we are atheistic, even if we're not actually atheists in the, in the normal sense of the word. So yes, but the reason why people don't have that is because of an internal desire to be away from Krishna. So what is it that Krishna says? Savasya chaham ridi shani vishto matasmriti gyanamapohanamcha. Right? Krishna says, I give knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. Chapter 15, text number 15 in the Bhagavad Gita. So 
Why is it that some people are atheists? Why is it some people are even born into situations where they don't have to hear about Krishna? It's because they don't want to. And Krishna is reciprocating with their desire to be as far away from him as possible by giving them a situation and a circumstance which will match their own internal desire. So it's all about our desires. The more that we desire Krishna, the more that Krishna will manifest. And how do we, how do we, how do we feel that desire? That comes by good association, especially association with devotees who are more advanced than we are. And their desire for Krishna will also become ours if we serve them with humility and, and sincerity. Okay. So thank you for your question, David Nandapandit Prabhu. Any other questions or comments? Sri Devi, please, thank you for joining the call. If you have a question, I, I, I'm, I'm just inquisitive about your question so that I can learn. <laughs> Well, please accept my humble obeisance to Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu. As always, it's a complete delight and a pleasure and a very intellectually and spiritually stimulating experience to hear the different points that you bring out in this uh, particular uh, verse and the class. So thank you very much for that. You know, many things came to my mind, but I have a question. Mm -hmm. Well, rather two. First is, would you please share that particular um, purport where Srila Prabhupada talks about, you know, anger, bitterness, resentful, you mentioned that, but I would like to know that particular verse because I'm interested in that being, a, you know, in the mental health field, that's one. The second question I have for you is, yes. I am lusting for something that I don't really need. Mm -hmm. I have, a, I'm just giving an example. I already have a winter coat, but I have seen a beautiful winter coat in the shop window as I'm going. And I look at it and I start longing to have that coat. I start thinking, oh my God, this is such a beautiful coat. I've not bought a winter coat for ages. Mine is old and you know it's ragged. It's serviceable. It will do perfectly well. And I don't really need that coat. But my mind keeps going again and again and again. And I mm -hmm. think, you really, can, you, you know, you really need to pamper yourself. You know, you've been scrimping and saving for so long. You've been so frugal for so long. So now you can go ahead and splurge a little bit. It's okay. You can do it. I mean, this is the way Maya tricks you into lusting after things of this world. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, how can I have compassion for myself? Because I had a very frugal childhood. I had a very frugal upbringing. So sometimes I think to myself, being so tight with myself, you know, and not taking really good care of myself. Now I should be, you know, in a position to take good care of myself. So there's so many ways the mind plays tricks like this. Yeah. And I was thinking, what are the ways in which one can deal with this situation where one really doesn't need it, but one has all these mental longings for it? It's a great question. Thank you. Well, well I've seen it, well, I've seen in my own life is that when there's a desire for something, I start by asking myself, why? What's the underlying need? So for example, and, and some of the needs are legitimate, by the way. Okay, so let's, let's look at this, because I've, I've kind of, I was working on a framework around this, right? So for example, let's say that someone wants to buy a particular um, you know, product, right? And you know that they don't need it but they want to buy it. So then if you start to explore, okay, what does that product represent for you? You know, it, it represents, um, it represents a, a sense of um, prestige or importance, right? So they're trying to buy something very expensive, an expensive watch or whatever. So if you start to look into it, you can get to the underlying need that this particular behavior represents. And once you know the underlying need, you can see, okay, is this, is, there, is this the best way to fulfill it? Or are there other ways to fulfill that same need? Um, there was a very interesting thing. I'll, I'll see if I, uh, let me see if I can find this for you. I was reading one of my spiritual master's books. And he talks about wants and needs. And he, he, really, he, he really put this very, very nicely. I'm just trying to see if I've got the book with me right here. Because otherwise I could read this to you directly give me one second 
I'm going to see if I can get the book. It's from Spirit Leadership for an Age of Higher Consciousness, Part Two, and it directly relates to what you're asking. Give me one second. Sure. Excellent. So I found it. So I'm going to read something to you because there's a, there's a specific place in the book where it gives a list of needs and wants. So I want to see if I can find this particular section. Once I read this, it gave me so much insight into what is going on with all of us, because unless you understand a bit deeper what's behind your desires, well, unless we understand more deeply what's behind our desires, we will always be a victim of our desire. I'll give you an example that I was talking about with someone else before, and this is some very interesting work that anyone can do. Whenever you see a behavior in the world, even in devotees, which is not healthy, you can also trace it back. There's a, there's a technique that you can use and you can trace that behavior back to the underlying misconception that's causing that particular behavior. So some people, for example, they're people pleasers. So what they do is they just want everyone, they need everyone to like them, okay? And then you say, okay, so someone is a people, and they know that they like this and they don't want to be. They want to have more integrity. They want to have more um, character and be more principled, but they've got this, ha this habit. So then what you do is you ask them, OK, so you find that you end up just saying whatever you think people want to hear rather than what you really believe, rather than what you really know is true. OK, so then the first question is, OK, why is it important that people like you? Right. Why is it important? Oh, I want people to like me because if they like me, then I'll feel valuable. OK, OK. Why? Why do you need other people to validate you to make you feel valuable? Okay, if I think about it, why do I need other people to validate me to make me feel valuable? If I go back, it's, it, it's because I don't value myself properly. You see? So you see the behavior and then you work backwards and then you get to the underlying belief, which is a misconception, right? And then the question is, okay, so you are a people pleaser because you want people to like you. You want people to like you because if people because you feel that if people like you, then you means you then you feel that you're valuable, and you only feel you're valuable if people like you, which means that without people liking you, you don't value yourself properly, right? So you don't value yourself properly. That's the underlying. That's the underlying issue. The underlying issue is I'm not valuable. Now the next question is: Is that actually true? Is it true? that you're only valuable if other people say you are, right? So you got down to the core belief and then you question that core belief. Is this core belief actually true? And the, for us as devotees, what we say is, is this core belief in line with Guru Sadhu Shastra? Does the scripture say that if other people don't agree with me, that therefore I'm not valuable? Is that what the scripture says? Yes or no? Of course not. It's not, it's not like that at all, you see? So then if you, if you get things down to the, to the root and then you question that root conception, is this actually in line with scripture? Is this actually true? Is it true that I'm only valuable if people agree with me? When you ask yourself that question, what you're actually doing, it's like, um, it's like you've got, a, have you ever seen these balls of wool, right? You have a ball of wool, yeah. Now, what you're doing is when you're asking yourself a question about a misconception, you're like unraveling the ball of wool. So it's all this knot, you're, un you're untying the knot. And eventually, if you keep doing this, you'll completely remove that particular misconception. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the same way, to your point about needs, what we start to do is we start to look at those needs and we start to see what's behind it. You know, now let's be very clear, though. Some people, the needs that they have, or are the, um, the desires that they have 
are legitimate needs and they're and they're not against Krishna consciousness so they can be engaged right it's not that everything is like you can't you can't do it it's not like that at all and because we have different types of mental conditioning therefore we do require some particular situations that will be favorable for us to continue our Krishna consciousness I'll give you an example I was with Seth, I was with Chandramali Maharaj. That was it. We were at one of the disciples' retreats. I believe it was Slovenia. And at the end of the retreat, I paid the obeisances to Chandramali Maharaj, and I asked, I, I gave my obeisances. I said, Maharaj, I'm about to leave. I said, Maharaj, is there any last instruction for me? And he says yes. And then Chandramali Maharaj said to me, he said, Bhutabhavna, your nature is such that you always need to find some fresh way of presenting Krishna consciousness. He told me that. He said, you need to find new and innovative ways to spread Krishna consciousness. He said, if you don't do that, it, it, it won't work for you because that's the way your mind is. Your mind requires you to find fresh and new ways. Very, very interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He could understand my nature. And he said, you need to do your Krishna consciousness in this way. There are other devotees. I know many devotees, they do well by doing everything the same way every single day. For other devotees, they're able to engage the mind by having some new innovative ways of, of engaging the, the mind in, in serving Krishna. You see? Different mm -hmm. things for different people because we're personal. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I found the page, by the way. So this is, okay. this is in Leadership for an Age of Higher Consciousness, page 62. It may be a different page on a different print, but I'll read this to you. It's a table. And so Bhakti Titamaj writes, people want sympathy, people need empathy. He mm. says, people want riches, they need fulfillment. People want fame, but they need appreciation. Mm. People want power, they need support and opportunity. People mm. want domination, they need protection. People want prestige, but they need recognition and acceptance. Mm. People want freedom. They need good guidance and facility. He says mm. people want intoxication, right? We see that in the world. People want drugs, alcohol. He said they need altered states of awareness and self-actualization. Mm. So when I studied this, I realized something very, very interesting. Mm. When we talk about people's wants, we're dealing with the mode of passion or ignorance. When we mm. go back to the underlying need, we're dealing with the mode of goodness or transcendence. Ultimately, on the transcendental level, we only need one thing or one person. That's Krishna. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but because we are also yeah. human, but because we're also human, as Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, that quote I gave you from Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he says, unless one is a Paramahamsa, one has to have good care for the body, good stimulation for the mind, good social situation, and study of the scripture to see how everything fits together. That's from Chaitanya Shikshamrita by Bhaktiv no Thakur. You see? So it's all there. Yep. So back to your point, Sir Devi, we may want to buy something, but what then you, if, if, you, if we question ourselves, okay, what is it I'm looking for? It may be that one is looking for some kind of fresh new experience, right? Now, the next question is, okay, do I have to get it just by buying something? Or are there other ways? Are there better ways? Are there more fulfilling ways that I can experience some difference? I know some devotees, when I was very young in Krishna consciousness, I had such an incredible time. My youth in Krishna consciousness was incredible. Why? Because what, what was done, and this is a formula, by the way. When I was young in Krishna consciousness, I was given Krishna consciousness according to my need as a young person, right? So what do young people need? They need to know about themselves. So we got to know about ourselves through the scriptures and through good association with spiritual masters. They need fun. So we were able to have fun sadhu sangha, right? Fun, you know, fun, you know, fun in, in kirtan, right? So fun with our friends who are devotees of the same age, right? When I was young in Krishna, what does a young person need? They need friendships. So I was able to be friends with other young people who also want to be devotees. So it was still Krishna consciousness, but it was given according to the nature of a young person. Mm. You see? So this is how it works. This is how it actually works. So to your point, what do we, so what do we, we okay, I have a desire to buy something or to spend. What am I looking for? Why do I want to buy that? 
What does it mean to me? Okay, if I buy this expensive car, it'll mean that I'm sophisticated, I'm getting something new. See, often when people buy new things, they're actually looking for stimulation, isn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. I want to buy a new car, a new phone, a new technology. They're looking for stimulation. And if I'm looking for stimulation, but let's do this together because I already have the answer in my mind. If someone wants to be stimulated, it means that they're not feeling stimulated right now, which means that right now they're feeling, and it begins with B, they're feeling what? Bored. Exactly. You see? So you, so you look at it externally, oh, you know, he's going and spending money on this expensive car. Okay, why though? The question is why? What does that car, so you can ask them, what does the car, why, you know, why do you want to buy, yeah, you know, I'll get to, you know, try something new, drive in a new place. You, you, and if you start to scratch beneath the surface, you'll find out what the car means to him and, and, you under, and it always comes back. It always come back, comes back to some underlying needs. Mm -hmm. Many people who, who shop is because they're bored, right? Mm -hmm. They're bored. So then the question is, okay, what can we do in Krishna consciousness that will be exciting and dynamic and new? I was, I was in 1999, it was such, I was telling a friend about this the other day. It was such an interesting experience. I was at the Vyas Puja of Shiv Ram Swami. Mm -hmm. Right? And, mm -hmm. um, and, and Tamal Krishnamaraj was there. We were, we, went to, we were at a devotee's house. One of the disciples of Tamal Krishnamaraj, Shiv Ram Maharaj was there. It was this Vyas Puja. And Tamal Krishnamaraj was glorifying Shiv Ram Swami. Right? Mm -hmm. And what did he say? He, but as part of that get together, Tamal Krishnamaraj was speaking about why he went to go to university to do his PhD. He did a PhD on, on Gaudiya Vaishnavism. His mm -hmm. PhD at, at Cambridge University was on Prabhupada's intellectual contribution to the Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophy. Mm -hmm. right? And that PhD became the book by Tamal Krishnamaraj, um, um, A Living Theology, Krishna, Krishna Bhakti, of A Living Theology, something along those lines is the title. Now, Tamal Krishnamaraj explained why he went to do his studies at university. He said, I know my nature, right? He said, I'd made devotees, I'd opened temples, I'd you know, engaged in you know, various types of preaching activities. He said, I needed a fresh challenge. That's what he mm. said. I mm. needed a fresh challenge. That's why I went back to university. Mm. You see? So again, to your point, which is a very, very important question. When we do things externally, what we should do, the, the trick is to ask ourselves, why am I doing this? What is it that I'm looking for through this activity? Right? Mm. And what's mm -hmm. the underlying? So what's so try and work out what's the underlying need? And once mm -hmm. you know the underlying need, then you can do something very amazing. You can see what are the other ways that I can fulfill this underlying need. Right. Mm. And you often find that there are ways you can fulfill the underlying need, which are more directly Krishna conscious. And therefore, you can get the spiritual benefit along with the with the need being fulfilled. Make sense? Oh, yeah, definitely. And thank you for walking me through that process, because as you said, unraveling and mm. working your way through it is very, very important. And sometimes it can be pretty painful. Because yes. we don't like to look at certain aspects of ourselves, you know, those are those dark rooms. You don't want to go there. Yeah. But, <laughs> to but, they I, don't exist. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, actually, when we get used to it, it becomes amazing nectar. Because mm -hmm. what happens is most people, they're not free. We're, we're, we're hypnotized by advertising. Therefore, mm -hmm. people don't even know what their underlying needs are. They just feel mm -hmm. like I've got to go on social. A lot of people go on social media all the time. If they stop for a moment to think, why do I always need to go on social media? Why am I always checking Facebook? Oh, I'm bored. Ah, oh, I'm bored. Or I feel I don't have real connection with people. Mm -hmm. I'm lonely. And then the next question is, oh, the reason why I'm constantly checking social media is because I feel lonely. Oh, okay, now I know it's because I feel lonely. Okay, now the next question is, is this the best way to deal with my loneliness? And often they'll say, no, it's not. I'm, I keep going on social media because I'm lonely. And, and, even, and the more I go on social media, <laughs> the more lonely I feel. It's not doing anything. It's not solving the problem at all. So then it's like, okay, but now I've worked out what the underlying issue is. Now I can consciously think, 
what is the best way to fulfill this need for connection? Loneliness mm -hmm. is the absence of connection, right? Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. And so now I understand this is a real issue. How can I fulfill the underlying issue? Then I go and do that. And that way I get the deep fulfillment because, and it's a very interesting model. When you try to do something on the level of the mode of ignorance, very no, no fulfillment, just, just, it, just, it just causes one to become more tamasic, more covered. When you try to fulfill a need at the level of the mode of passion, you get stimulation, but you don't get the real, the real deep, deep solution. The only way to fulfill a need in a way that gives you peace or transcendence, you have to fulfill it on the level of the mode of goodness that can make your mind peaceful or even better on the level of transcendence where you actually come closer to Krishna, who's the real solution to the issue. So you either do it in the mode of goodness where you engage it in Krishna's service or you do it on the level of Krishna consciousness by doing it in direct relation to Krishna. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's how it should be done. Then you, then you get deep fulfillment from is most people they're not happy they they feel empty but we don't do this activity of really looking what's deep what's the deep need that i'm not fulfilling and that's why most people are unhappy because part of the deep the deepest need of everyone is transcendence is mm -hmm. spirituality is to give and receive divine love that's the deepest need of every living entity so when people mm -hmm. ignore that by doing other things, going around, just buying stuff that they don't need, engaging in activities that, that aren't good for them, it never solves the real problem. So they do so much and still feel so empty. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Mental health clinics are replete with people who are just desperately searching for happiness, satisfaction, joy, peace, love. And doing all this, you know, eating anonymous, alcoholics anonymous, shoppers anonymous, all this is, you know, because of that hole in the heart, you know, that they're trying to fill with all these different activities and addictions and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you for a very really exhaustive explanation and step by step explanation. Also, I think this is quite helpful for me to mull over. And I will definitely also look at the leadership uh, book that you mentioned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Namrata, I saw your hand up. You have a question? How can I serve you? Um, first of all, thank you, Prabhuji. My humble obeisances for the wonderful class. I always look forward for your class. <laughs> so, uh, and one thing uh, also, one has to be very attentive to your class. If one, you know, even loses a word, then entire time we are struggling to uh, join the links. <laughs> so <laughs> my question is the follow-up question. Um, from, from what Sri Devi Mataji was telling and what you were telling, the underlying um, need. So the how everybody is not so much intelligent to understand the underlying need. So how can one uh, understand underlying need? As with anything, it becomes better with practice. But as with anything, we can also learn it better through, through assistance. So even if you just begin by asking yourself this question, why am I doing what I'm doing? If you ask yourself that question, and if you and you, sometimes you have to keep digging or keep reflecting and you will eventually come to the underlying need. The underlying needs are the human needs. OK, so, for example, there are some people who are sex addicts, to be honest, some people who are sex addicts. But what's the underlying need? They feel they need a connection. It's actually a connection that if they really look at it and therefore it's not so much about the sex, it's actually a sense of connection. They need to feel a deep sense of connection and close relationship with other people. But they're looking for it in the wrong way. That's where it becomes problematic, you see? So in any situation, if we start to practice this, and especially when we do it with people who know us, and sometimes you can even try different things and see what works, right? So let's say that, let's say that someone ends up wasting money all the time. 
and they think, why, you know, why do I just keep spending money on things I don't need? Like, what's the underlying need? Oh, you know, I think I may be bored, right? Okay, then the next question is, what, what, what are some things that I can do in my day that I find exciting? Let's say that they're a devotee. It may be, you know what? I need, to, I need to preach. I need to find new preaching projects. It may be I need to speak. I need to do new. In I need to try new ways of of practicing Krishna consciousness or spreading Krishna consciousness. It may be I need to learn new aspects of the teachings, right? It may be I need to engage in a new type of Krishna conscious project. You see, whatever it is, and then you can try different things. It may be I need. To, maybe I'm not associating with the devotees who who I find are stimulating me in the right way. So it may be that I need to associate with a different group of devotees and see what comes from there. So you can try different things. And when you try different things, if you pay attention, it's so interesting. You just pay attention to how you feel. Wow, I'm suddenly, I'm suddenly now more inspired in my Krishna consciousness. Wow, I'm suddenly more, you know, I, I'm suddenly feel more enthusiastic, you see? There's actually a bit, there's another side. Christian just gave me this realization, which I'll share with you on this. There's two sides to this. Sometimes devotees are doing something and, you know, they, and they, they try to understand what's the underlying need. And then they try to fulfill that need. There's two sides to needs. There's things which fulfill those needs. And there's things which suppress or block that need. So sometimes a person is frustrated and, then, and things aren't, and they're not so enthusiastic because a certain need is being deliberately attacked. Let's say that someone needs, they need to feel a sense of, um, I don't know, um, freedom in Krishna consciousness, but they're serving in a, in a project where they're told what to do all the time and there's no freedom for them to, to, to preach in a new and interesting way, you see? So it's like, okay, I have a need for freedom, but what's happening is in this service, I'm being suppressed and held back. So I can't, so that's what's, that's what's causing me to feel frustrated. So with needs, there's two sides. There's, so there's three different elements. There can be a neutral space where your needs aren't being met, but they're not being blocked. Then there's a situation where your needs are being held back or blocked. And there's a situation where your needs are being fed and sufficiently, they're being nourished. Right. So you have to see. If you're in a neutral space, that's OK, because you can move forward. If your needs are being taken care of, that's the best. But if your needs are being held back. Then that could be another cause of frustration. I hope does that answer. Or does that give some food for thoughts? Um, yes, um, I think uh, still I feel. Um, can association and uh, reading uh, and reading shastra mm -hmm. or sadhu sangha can uh, help you uh, understand the underlining need? Yes, definitely. Just like I gave the example of Chandra Mullin Maharaj helping me to understand. Because when he told me what he said, when he told me that point, I, I wasn't conscious of it. But he told me, and when he said that, I was like, oh, yeah, of course. That makes complete sense. Yeah, I am like that. I do need that. You see? So association can definitely help. But you can also become better at this by practice. Yeah. So I, says, I gave that quote from the Leadership for an Age of Higher Consciousness Part 2 book. If you read that section, that can also help you to kind of think in that particular way. I think it's page 62. Yes, yeah, page 62. And this, this section is called... It's called, the heading is number, this is, um, this is part two of the book and it's called Servant Leadership Past and Present. And it was point number eight, a servant leader keeps everyone engaged according to their propensities. Okay, and it's within that section. And this is very important because that section is really the principle of Varnashram. That sometimes people feel a bit frustrated and they feel some, some stagnation because certain needs that they have are not being taken care of. They're not being fulfilled. Certain legitimate human needs. You know, the, in the Mahabharat, the Pandavas, why do they ask for five villages, right? Remember that there's a famous story. 
The Pandavas, they asked just for five villages. And what was Duryodhana's reply? He said, I will not give you enough land for the what? Anyone? Even equal to even equal to the tip of the needle. Exactly. Exactly, Namrata. But why did they want five villages? They explained we're Kshatriyas. We need somewhere to we need somewhere to rule, right? It's just this, they, they need something to be in charge of, to lead, to control, because they're Kshatriyas. That's just their, their human, their need according to their varna, you know? So it became a problem that they actually weren't able to do that. So this is how it works. So sometimes, sometimes legitimate human needs are not being taken care of, and therefore it becomes a cause of stagnation on the, on the, journey, on the journey to Krishna. Although one should never use that as an excuse, because we're still responsible to take care of our needs. It's not someone else's responsibility. And we can always make the decision to try something do something in Krishna consciousness that will allow those needs that we have to be met. Yeah. I might do a seminar on that in the future, actually. But it's such an important topic. Yeah. Does, so, yeah, that, that's, that's some points. Okay, thank you, Namrati. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Uh, thank you so much for the very valuable class. And... Uh, a uh, nice question answer session and uh, you explain very detailedly thank you so much thank uh, you i guess there are no more questions uh, yeah we can end the call here Prabhuji, with your okay. thank yeah. you so much to the proper part ki jai yeah. we always look forward. Ki yeah. jai. thank you all right Krishna. we always look forward to your sessions Prabhuji, and uh, we'll be waiting for your new seminar which you are talking now <laughs> so thank Thank you so Take much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, devotees, for participating. Uh, Hetal Mataji, you want to ask anything? No, I was just going to say thank you so much. Um, again, it was so amazing to hear you speak again. Thank you very much. You very and much. Um, and just, just a quick plug. I have an Instagram. Sure. And my Instagram is called the Edenoba. I was, well, my Instagram name is Edenoba. So I just post different things. Okay. It is a bit... It's meant for a broad audience, so it's not always direct. They're not really direct quotes from the scripture, but they are they are ideas based upon the scripture, which are related, which can also help people to understand wisdom and hopefully to connect over time um, in that way. Okay, just let you know. Sure, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.